Um, right, we'll kick off. So, um, so this evening we have um, where am I? Sorry, we have Tim Stokes from SAAI and Mark Sweeney from Enterprise Ireland, and they are going to discuss the uh, Eco Design Directive. Uh, just before we kick off, for anybody that's online, um, if you want have any questions, if you email engineers webcast at gmail.com we'll get your questions so that's engineers with an s webcast at gmail.com uh, we'll be able to get your questions um, so with that we'll ask the guys to kick off good evening everybody uh, i just begin i'd just like to give an overview of the eco design directive in terms of of the, it's, it, the process itself, products that are covered, the impacts of the directive and the regulations under the directive, uh, in particular for Ireland. Uh, just as background, uh, the Eco Design Directive itself, it doesn't set any uh, standards for products. It's a framework directive. It just sets the rules for the regulations that come underneath it. So it's a EU, it, it, it provides consistent across the market EU-wide rules for improving the energy and the also the environmental performance of products. It can also address other issues such as product information and, and, and extend into other areas as well. So it's an Article 95 measure, which basically means it prevents barriers to trade by harmonizing the European single market. Uh, it's, it's, it pre prevents anti-competitive -comp issues between member states. All products that are regulated under the Eco Design Directive, uh, under the framework, are implemented via implementing measures or regulations. So they apply across the board in member states. They don't have to be uh, reapplied in any individual member state. And anything covered under Eco Design, an important one here is it's covered, uh, they need to be CE marked. So it's one. It's a new approach directive. It's also uh, in conjunction with a number of other directives, low voltage, etc. So if the, the product does not comply with Eco Design, it cannot be CE marked. Just remember, Eco Design Directive also works in conjunction with the Energy Labeling Directive. So they're very much entwined. The Eco Design Directive is designed to, to push weight, set rules, set minimum energy performance standards or environmental standards to push poorer product off the market. It's a bit like a front runner approach. The rules gradually increase, the MEPs increase, and products are pushed off the market. But to assist consumers in their purchase of products and what products they buy, the energy labeling directive. So the rules that are set under eco design uh, will align with the labels that are set under the energy labeling directive. Some of the products covered, it's very, very wide. Uh, you can see here a lot of uh, consumer products, some business to business products, distribution transformers there, large ventilation systems. It's, it's, it's one of the challenges for ourselves, the amount of products that are covered it's also not just products covered, there are horizontal measures in incorporated also, so things like standby. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a very, as you can see, it covers everything, HVAC, lighting, practically everything, and it will be extended into the future to cover other products that are cu currently under study. From the Irish context, you can see here as well, in terms of the impacts and in terms of the energy usage, the major, the major sectors here would be the heating sector heating and cooling in, in Europe, but predominantly heating in Ireland, uh, lighting uh, and household products. In terms of the benefits for the EU, it's, it's, it's actually been a very, very successful policy instrument from a European perspective. Uh, eco design and energy labeling contribute to around half of the, the energy savings targets that the EU have under the Energy Efficiency Directive which, which is, is it's, 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 you know, it, it's been a big success story in terms of the, the savings. And this is just a, a, a diagram here, a graphic that actually shows uh, one, the sectors, a uh, business as usual scenario, and the difference caused by eco design in terms of the savings. Also CO2 emissions, and, and people are, are really sort of honing in on this. 320 million tonnes every year in terms of the report that, 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 that looked at this. So there's big CO2 emissions here and it supports the, you know, the aims of the Paris Agreement. In terms of the consumer, the average, this figure has actually gone slightly up based on recent uh, calculations. Over 500 euros per year, the average European consumer saves in electricity spend because of the eco design and energy labeling directives. And that translates into, in, in terms of 
European industry and its retail as well. Uh, 55 billion both in savings and extra revenue for uh, European industry, which, which equates to around 800,000 jobs. So one thing to remember uh, in, in terms of this regulation, it's very, industry are very pro this regulation. It's good for industry and it's good for the consumer. The process itself looks quite complicated and it can be sometimes. Uh, it's a detail, trans it's a very transparent process and a shared process. There's a lot of room for consultation. It's quite open. Uh, it, it's a long process from start to finish. And how it works, the commission themselves uh, in the initial and the early days looked at what products use a lot of electricity, a lot of energy. Uh, and they came up with a working plan which looked at X number of products, the, the big, the motors of the world, lighting, HVAC, and they, they carried out, they, they, they used consultants most of the time to look, carry out review studies, sorry, uh, preparatory studies on these products. And these preparatory studies are carried out with a specific methodology. They're very detailed reports. They're very interesting reports if you're interested in a particular technology because they look at the market, uh, how these products penetrate the market, the sales, energy usage. They're, they're, they're interesting reports if you're interested in these sectors. They take about two years to produce. After that, the commission come up with a draft proposal, which a consultation forum, which is uh, trade experts, consumer organizations, member states, NGOs, uh, look at this and then refine the proposal. The proposal. So it's an interesting process. It then, uh, the process can take all in all about, you know, 40 to 42 months and usually longer in all honesty depending on the product and how complicated it is. But it does go then to vote for eco-design. Uh, so it's voted, we're actually in the middle of a package of votes at the minute on certain products. And for energy labeling, it's not a vote, but the expert committee discusses the regulation because it's intertwined with the eco-design leg legislation and the commission can either accept or reject it. So it's a long process, but it's important. One thing I would say is it's very important for industry to be aware of this process and to get involved in it. The Commission are very open to stakeholders being involved. So if you, if you have a product or a range of products that you're working with or a company that manufactures these products, you really should be involved here. It's a chance to get your speak in here and to, to influence the regulations. So what does a regulation look like? What's incorporated in a regulation? It's directly applicable across all member states, so full harmonization. So if you have a product and you want to place it on the market in Europe, it needs to comply with eco design. De each regulation would have a definition and a scope, so products either within scope or outside scope within that regulation. It sets minimum, minimum performance standards and product information standards for consumers and for, for suppliers, manufacturers. They're usually stage requirements, so they don't just come in the regulation enters into force and then you will have a set of staged MEPs over a number of years. Every regulation will have a review clause. It's usually between five and seven years where the regulation is sent back, it's reviewed with the same process, a long review study and the whole process starts again. So it's continuous improvement and we're at the review stage for a large number of products now. Yeah. Measurement methods, standards, all based on harmonized standards in Europe. And it is an issue, as we'll see later, in terms of a challenge. If the standards aren't there, it's very difficult to police it. So it's virtually impossible to regulate them by eco design. Uh, verification procedures exist for market surveillance authorities. Uh, we're moving in, Tim will speak about this later in terms of market surveillance. Uh, I have been involved probably from 2009. Uh, in terms of formulation of these regulations. A lot of them are coming into play the last few years, the stage requirements, and they need to be policed. And it is a challenge, and we're, we're trying to address that. Some examples, heating, appli heating appliances. Some of the regs under heating appliances, oil and gas boilers, water heaters, solid fuel boilers, local space heaters, there's a range of them there. One of them, just to pick one out, some of the requirements under it, the solid fuel boiler regulation. This covers boilers from zero to 500 kilowatt, possibly up to up to one megawatt shortly. Uh, it's it's boilers that are regulated outside the medium combustion plant directive or the IED directive. So you look at energy efficiency is one of the parameters regulated, but then you see other parameters outside and outside energy, particulate matter, PM, 
So you're looking at, at atmospheric pollutants here and they're regulating these. Now this is, this is quite new for people working in the sector. These, pro these, you know, these parameters have never been regulated before and it's something they're looking to extend to a lot of products, looking at you know, areas outside environment, oh, sorry, outside energy. Lighting, where this week, this coming week, I'll be at a lighting review proposal meeting. It's the culmination of the process that we looked at earlier on. And lighting is an interesting sector. If we go back to, you know, just over 10 years ago, we were looking at a different, a completely different range of products that are being then in comparison to what is being sold on the market now. And that has been driven by eco design legislation. The reason this review is looking at, there's three existing uh, measures for lighting that look at tertiary lighting, household lighting, and they're all being merged into one single proposal. And the reason is the, the maps that were actually set have driven the market towards LED lighting. All lighting going forward will be LED. Now there will be some exceptions allowed for a certain non-household applications such as entertainment, lighting, emergency lighting, things like that. So there's always exceptions to the rule. But in general, this has driven the market towards LED lighting. Regulations are not the only mechanism whereby you can be uh, uh, products can be regulated as such under eco design. You can have voluntary agreements. They're unusual, but they do exist. There's two at the moment: imaging equipment and complex set-top boxes, your Sky or Virgin Media boxes. And the reason being is there are a small number of market players that control a certain large percentage of the market, usually over seventy percent of the market. So it makes sense that the group of of companies can come together with a you know a code of practice uh, that is monitored by the commission it's very similar to the rules that are set under eco design but it's a voluntary agreement and there's two in place one's in a bit of trouble at the moment complex set top boxes but we'll wait and see it should it should move on so implement in terms of implementation of the regulations the commission does provide a lot of help here there are websites there on the commission website under eco design and energy labeling uh, and some things to be aware of would be, in particular, there are a lot of guidelines for certain products. So if you work in a, in a sector, be it HVAC, lighting, there are FAQs and guidelines there, quite detailed, that are very useful for manufacturers, but in particular retailers and suppliers, distributors. Uh, energy label templates, you can actually, there is a, a, an energy label generator there that you can access, put in your product information and it will generate the labels for you in a particular format and send them out to you so you can use them particularly for retailers a new one to, to that is very apt it is important is this new april database which comes into force in first of january 2019 but there will be an extension in terms of of uh, a few months in terms of it actually coming into play because there are issues technical issues in terms of uploading onto the database and that is uh, it looks at the, the manufacturer will have to if a product is covered under energy labeling and uh, they will have to put information on that product up onto this database so the consumer and the market surveillance authorities will be able to access this get the information if it's not on the database it doesn't comply so it's a big owner you know it's onerous on the manufacturer or the supplier but there's, there's huge benefits for, uh, from it uh, challenges this is my last slide uh, and you could write a book on this. There, there's so many challenges there that we could, you know, we come across within eco design and energy labeling. So in terms of scope, the extension of the scope beyond just energy use is very challenging. The circular economy package in 2015 requested that eco design be used as a facility for incorporating resource efficiency parameters into products. So we're looking at that at the moment. On Monday evening, there was a vote on refrigeration appliances. Uh, and quite a lot of the dis discussion was around uh, incorporating resource efficiency requirements, uh, things on spare, or requirements around spare parts, requirements around durability, recyclability, all these type of things. They're quite complex, uh, and one of the complexities would be that there's there's not you know there's no standards there or such. So SEN Lex SEN have to be mandated to develop these standards before we can actually look at them. Products versus systems. It's all very well to regulate. Uh, I often use the example of light. It's very easy to regulate a lamp and make sure that the lamp that is placed on the market is the highest efficiency. It's an A-rated a, a lamp, but it doesn't prevent a designer coming in and putting 500 lamps into a room. 
So we have to think about the building envelope and the system that these products are being used in. The other example or the other issue would be where products are actually used within products. So you may have a pump, you may have a motor, you may have a different type of product in a larger product. product. Do you define the individual parts or do we define the whole system? So that's an issue that we continually come across. Internet of Things and, and related smart appliances. There are also other issues, smart appliances in particular going forward, in that it may not, not just be about energy usage of an appliance, it may be about energy storage. It may be about how that appliance works with other appliances. So there are other issues that we will have to think about going forward. Internet of Things, standby. Standby was a huge issue in 2008, but as we move forward, it's still an issue. You'll find that a lot of appliances that have been regulated under EcoDesign can be left on standby now because there is a 0.5 watt you know, regulation there that you can't exceed uh, and it's lowering. But years ago, some of the equipment could use, use up to a quarter of its energy usage in standby. It's not an issue now. People leave their TVs and their things on and this regulation addressed that market, market failure and, and addresses some of those issues. But going forward, it's network standby. Everything you have now. I was at a meeting on Monday in terms of refrigeration appliances. I couldn't believe how networked these appliances are going to become over future years. And, and, and it's a big issue for us in terms of market surveillance, but also in terms of how to measure it. So network standby is a big issue. The process itself, both from member states and the commission itself, there's such a wide variety of products and categories there in terms of getting data on these products in terms of the physical resources to move these regulations forward to monitor them to there's quite a lot of work there and that's a big challenge uh, standardization I mentioned earlier on about the heating regulation there where the, it looks at solid fuel boilers to 500 uh, kilowatt and the reason it doesn't look to one megawatt everything else is covered by the way under the MCP directive and IED directive is because there's no standard there to measure it so if there's no standard, harmonized standard there, we can't enforce it. There's no market surveillance that can be actually carried out because the manufacturer can't measure. There's no standard there. So that can be an issue, development of standards. What we have done or what the Commission Service have actually done over the last number of years would be to mandate SEN, SENELEC for a number of standards on particular products while the regulation is being developed. So at least they can carry out, out a lot of the groundwork and a lot of the work there so the processes can align uh, it's not it doesn't always work like that in practice the energy labeling there's a new energy labeling regulation which uh, brings back the a to g regulation sorry a to g label so the a plus a double plus a triple plus is gone now there is a there will be a time period as we revert into the new label for different products as they come under review so that's a little bit of an issue but just to note that it's, it will be an A to G label going forward. Uh, the EPREL, the new database, which I've mentioned already, uh, that should be a, a big positive, but there are issues around how it's implemented and how it works in practice. Another, uh, another issue would be Brexit, and it's, it's not a definite, we don't know where we are yet in terms of Brexit, but two of the issues that could come to the fore would be conformity assessment. If third-party conformity assessment, which is being discussed at the moment in terms of certain products, comes into play, then notified bodies in the UK would have to move outside the UK or we'd, you would have to use bodies outside the UK as notified bodies. So it could be an issue in terms of the labs you use or whatever. Uh, the, the other major one will be in terms of economic operators. A distributor who currently buys something in from the UK in terms of a product and sells it in the marketplace, that's fine. But in, in case of uh, you know a, a hard Brexit scenario, they could end up being the actual importer. So the requirements of EcoDesign falls on, on, on that particular op market operator. So you're, they are technically placing the product on the market. So all the major requirements, it's up to that particular, they may be a distributor now, but they could be the importer under the regulation going forward. So there would be a lot of requirements placed on them in terms of the directive. And the last and one, one of the biggest challenges in terms of EcoDesign would be around market surveillance uh, and with that I'm going to hand over to Tim Stokes who is responsible for market surveillance in Ireland. Thank you. <clears throat> Which one's? Great. 
Good evening, uh, and uh, thanks for inviting me along uh, to talk today about um, market surveillance. Uh, my name is Tim Stokes, and I'm the program manager for the market surveillance program within the Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland. Um, so, what, I've actually put my glasses on. I didn't realise how small the text was, <laughs> so I can actually read. So. Uh, what I'm going to do is give you um, a, a fairly brief overview of market surveillance, what it is, um, the roles and responsibilities of the organisations involved in market surveillance, uh, SEI's approach to market surveillance, the key challenges, because within market surveillance itself there are several challenges and I can only really touch on those today. Um, I'll give you a bit of a case study so you can just get an indication, a good flavour of, of how market surveillance works in practice. Uh, and then just draw some conclusions based on um, my discussion, my uh, talk so far. So, market surveillance. I mean, what is it? Was it? What is it? Um, it is really, uh, you know, as you, as Mark pointed out, the CE mark is a fundamental um, thing that we're looking at, and because products are placed on the market or put into service on the basis of self-declaration in most cases, it means that there's plenty of opportunities for the less scrupulous or maybe the less knowledgeable to put products on the market which don't meet the standards that they say they meet. So market surveillance is required to keep an eye on those, uh, those economic operators to ensure that there is a, a fair um, level playing field for all those who are placing products on the market in the EU. So there's three sort of main strands to market surveillance as I see it. There's compliance promotion, um, so that's things like published guidance, and there's a lot of that available um, through the Commission website. And there's direct advice, bespoke advice that can be given to economic operators who are uh, wanting to get it right and who might approach us to say, well, before we put this on the market, are we right in our, uh, our assumptions about uh, how we can comply? Because sometimes it's quite difficult for them. And um, in terms of stakeholder engagement, there's, there's a, 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 a number of stakeholders, particularly trade associations and possibly bodies such as your own, who have an interest in um, making sure that products are compliant, whether it's putting them on the market or another term is putting into service when a product is actually uh, put into service on the market um, and that can apply to certain products and I'll cover those in due course. Uh, the second strand is around monitoring and verification, so we do a lot of inspections, uh, we do technical documentation checks, check the technical do documentation provided against the regulation to see that they're complying, very time consuming activity. Uh, we do screening testing and you could argue perhaps that uh, technical documentation check is a type of screening test, but we do physical screening tests as well on certain products, we actually examine them um, in certain ways and look to see whether they might comply or not. And then we undertake laboratory testing as well in certain instances um, to actually nail down is this product compliant or not. The third strand is around follow up and enforcement. So uh, our, our usual approach actually is to provide some sort of what we call technical assistance rather than diving straight into enforcement. Um, enforcement is a messy business which uh, can consume a lot of time. So you want to try and, it's a useful tool, but you want to try and steer clear from it if you can. So we tend to start with te technical assistance advising the, the economic operator what's wrong with their product and what they need to do to bring it into compliance. Um, but the enforcement stick is there for us if we need to use it, and then we have both civil and criminal enforcement routes that we can actually um, use. So I'd say it's about maintaining a level playing field. It is very much an international game, to use a footballing parlance, um, because if you catch a product in one country, um, if you don't do the same in the rest of the European econo economic area, uh, EFTA area, then it can pop up somewhere else. So it's very important that we work together um, to close things down. And it is a vital component of the EU product harmonization system. Without it, it can't work properly, it can't function properly, and won't deliver the savings that um, are envisaged. So in terms of the organizations who are responsible, there's the Department of Commun Communications, Climate Action and Environment uh, are currently actually the market Sponsor authority. Uh, in the process of transferring that delegate that designation over to SCAI um, and that really means they're the enforcement authority so that presents some problems for us already. Um, they are also the legislative body in terms of uh, drafting legislation and legislation has to be regularly reviewed um, for energy labelling uh, and they're also responsible for policy. Um, the Department of Business, Enterprise and Innovation are responsible for legislation of eco-design and for policy in that regard. 
And then SCAI um, has functional responsibility for market surveillance and we're soon to be the market surveillance authority. And together with Enterprise Ireland, uh, we form an overarching group, uh, implementation group for the regulations called the Energy Labelling and Eco Design Directives Implementation Group. And the aim of that group is to um, have a, uh, as to facilitate a joined up approach to the implementation of regulations, looking at all aspects of the information, implementation. Although market surveillance is a very key part of that, obviously. Uh, so just in terms of what the, the, the program actually uh, has at its disposal, we have two full-time staff, myself and a program executive. We have a contracted, uh, externally sort of contracted inspections team. Um, we work alongside a, long, a number of other functions within SCAI as well, particularly on the communication side of things for labelling, energy labelling and tyre labelling, because there's a major consumer dimension to that. But also with SCAI's brief in relation to um, engaging with businesses as well, we're well placed um, to do that type of activity. And um, I think one of the reasons that the, the market science function has only recently been, tr been transferred over to SCAI, it's back in 2016 in April, we basically were handed it and had to hit the ground running and start to develop a program straight away uh, from that. But um, uh, so, I mean, you know, we're, we're looking, we're seeking to identify, one of the reasons why it's transferred was the fact that there were uh, seem to be synergies and opportunities for pushing this through SCII and there's certainly some close linkages with some of the other things that we do including if you know anything about Tripoli e register uh, for example uh, the heart register and ACA but also the grant programs we're funding a lot of products which are going into businesses and into uh, consumers homes um, which are covered by eco design and energy labeling so we have a potential role there as well so we're still scoping out some of that uh, we haven't progressed too far on that but we're very aware of those possibilities so in terms of our approach, we have a very strong emphasis on compliance promotion, um, recognising SCI's unique position in that regard in Ireland. Um, we, uh, we obviously focus on monitoring and deterring non-compliance as well. That's an activity which uh, is a very time-consuming one. Um, we recognise the, the importance of stakeholders. It's a really important um, dimension of our approach that there are organisations out there um, who have a, a keen interest in ensuring compliance. So, for example, the trade associations, they want to defend their own members and pre prevent them from being undercut by uh, less scrupulous market operators or non-compliant market, market operators who might be externalising the costs of compliance. Um, and then there's the, the technical engagement side of things, which we're building on, and that is, uh, is a challenge, and I'll talk about that in due course. Uh, you, we need to have that technical capacity either within SCI or at our disposal to enable us to tackle some of the challenges. We also have a number of cross-cutting um, aspects to our approach. So partnership and collaboration is absolutely vital. I mentioned the international dimension to this. There's also the national dimension with other market surveillance bodies involved. Um, so I've actually come from two days of talking to the Latvian Market Surveillance Authority um, on a knowledge exchange uh, program, and it has been hugely beneficial, you know, especially as a new organisation to Market Surveillance. We're, we're learning a lot from them, and they've actually learned quite a lot from us, which is quite uh, reassuring as well that we're heading in the right direction. We've been involved in, uh, and are involved, and will be involved in various different EU-funded projects. So I spend a lot of time in Brussels, like Mark. We sometimes meet each other on the plane. Um, e Plant 2 is one of the ones where we're actually involved in network standby, uh, which Mark mentioned, and we're also involved in refrigeration on that. Um, we're, th th there's a big new project called E Plant 3, which is a 7 million euro project uh, funded by the Commission Horizon 2020, which is looking at a number of different product groups and a number of different activities, such as improving information systems, customs collaboration, a wide range of activities, which I think will have a transformational impact on market surveillance, which to date has been, uh, in fairness, quite weak across the EU. Uh, we've been involved in a, a tyre uh, labelling, because um, we do tyres as well, as uh, so we've been involved in a tyre labelling project called MS Tyre 15, which is very useful. And we're also involved in ad hoc um, partnership and collaboration, such as our Latvian experience today, uh, but also with the UK in particular on lighting, for example. We've been working with them because of the, the our markets are very similar. There's very close linkages. A lot of the products sold are exactly the same, so we work closely with them. Innovation is another theme. I think it's fair to say that there's plenty of scope for innovation in the market surveillance field by virtue of some of the lack of innovation that's gone on to date, I think, in that sector and the lack of resourcing. Uh, and uh, linked to that, information management, which I think you know, there's huge scope for 
Um, this is all about information in some respects, about who's the non-compliant one, sharing information regarding non-compliance. We need to know stuff about the market. It's massive implications from an information point of view. And as I mentioned, we're looking to seek synergies at all opportunities with other SCI activities. Just to give you a, a summary of the activity, a sort of flavour and a sense of the amount of work that we do. Um, in 2018, we did 100 retail, we did uh, energy labelling inspections for 110 retail outlets. It's about a sixth of all retail outlets with, with responsibility in the country. Uh, we inspected 138 tile retail outlets um, in relation to uh, particularly retailer compliance, but also manufacturer compliance, manufacturer tyres. So we look at both the retailer and the manufacturer's responsibilities in relation to tyres. Same with energy labelling, actually. The retailer, their responsibility to display the label, and the manufacturer, their responsibility to display the right label and the right information and provide the right information. Um, we've undertaken 27, uh, we've tested 27 uh, products uh, in laboratories, including lighting, uh, circulator pumps, refrigeration, appliances and tyres. Uh, we've assessed a number of websites and I'm afraid to say that the compliance of websites is extremely poor in relation to energy labelling and that's something we need to tackle and we will be tackling. Um, we have several enforcement cases ongoing at the moment, um, which is, I, I won't give you the exact number, but we, we have a, a number and they suck up time um, we so on the flavor of um, compliance promotion we produce an energy labeling retailer guide which is nearly ready to be uh, published and there's quite a few uh, guides for tire labeling um, and just in relation to that stakeholder engagement we've had five elding meetings this year that's the stakeholder group and various stakeholder um, sectoral stakeholder meetings with for example tires and lighting sector so here's just a couple of examples of retailer supports that have been developed by SCAI for tyres and for uh, energy labelling. So just onto the key challenges and, and hopefully some solutions as well. Um, so one of the one of the main ones, and Mark certainly uh, touched on this or more than touched on this, the key challenge relating to the breadth of the regulations. There's massive product coverage there. So yeah, how do we provide coverage across the full range of products? And one of the things that we've done in the last year is commission the development of a prioritization tool, which takes into account a number of factors, uh, risk factors, you know, energy consumption being one of the big ones and sales being one of the big ones um, and compliance rates, existing compliance rates being another dimension of it. And we can use that tool to enable us to pr prioritize product groups and focus our attentions um, well. Uh, we don't exclude products from being covered necessarily, and we have other things out there. And one of those, you know, to keep our antennae up is, uh, is stakeholder engagement. It's, you can get a lot of information from engaging with stakeholders as to where non-compliance is. They're the ones who know, the trade associations and things like that, and businesses themselves. Um, International collaboration again to cover the wide range of products. We, you know, we do talk to our other market defence authorities, but it's very much about building up good personal relationships with them, so you can pick up the phone and talk to them about technical issues. And also with the commission, the commission has a particularly um, helpful um, technical department there, which helps us with that. So it helps us to cover the, the, the range of products, and also the second challenge there about the technical um, competence there. Um, you know, the trade associations are often the source of good technical information and can advise us to some extent. We're seeking to build our own knowledge through staff training as well. Uh, and we need to, we're, we're trying to build our knowledge around the standard side of things, which I think is, still, is possibly still a bit of a weakness. Um, laboratory engagement can be very fruitful when they're undertaking laboratory testing of the products. If we engage them after that, we can um, talk to them about the results and, you know, you can find out a lot from engaging with the laboratory as to, uh, technical uh, dimensions. Um, consultants, consultants such as perhaps people in this room as well, um, <clears throat> we do occasionally utilise consultants. I can see possibly we could use consultants a bit more, uh, potentially in providing us with advice to make sure we're well advised because consider we might be taking enforcement action against a company to take a product off the market. Um, consider if we get that wrong and actually they were compliant and we spent all that money uh, taking them to court, you know, uh, testing the product, etc, etc, etc. We've got to get the technical bit right. What if the laboratory's done it wrong? Laboratories get things wrong, believe it or not. What, it, what if the laboratory's got it wrong? Again, we need to have good technical knowledge within SCAI to help us defend ourselves against that, I suppose. There is some organisational knowledge of certain product groups within SCAI that we can draw on as well. 
And then the third area um, which relates to the breadth of the regulations is the market knowledge. You know, such a wide mar um, breadth of products, we do not know, um, you know we can't possibly know uh, the market for those products. So we're trying to build our knowledge around using desk-based research, trade associations again, and pro purchasing product, um, information from market research companies as well, which is expensive, but it can be very useful in terms of targeting your efforts. Because this is about, it's about targeting, it's about risk, and it's about trying to identify the products most likely um, to be non-compliant and um, then taking action against those um, through or doing things like technical documentation checks. Just to give you an example, the technicality can also be a challenge for economic operators too. So in the lighting sector, this is what they've got to comply with. Um, energy, I might have missed one off here as well. Energy labelling regulation, eco-design directive, low voltage directive, electromagnetic compatibility directive, radio electric directive, radio equipment directive, sorry, ROS, REACH. Some of these companies are bringing in products with responsibilities, manufacturer responsibilities of just importers. They, they bring products into the country from China, typically, directly into Ireland, and they badge them up in their own names. And they've got to understand all of this. You know, uh, clearly, some don't <laughs> from our experience. In fact, quite a few don't. So you know, it's an area where we're trying to work with trade associations to build the knowledge of industry. Um, the cost of verifying compliance is another key challenge. Uh, just to give you an example, if I want to test a heat pump, it costs uh, 10,000 euro for one heat pump, plus fat probably. Uh, I have to test four if I want to prove non-compliance. So huge. Now, we currently have powers to recover costs if we go to court, but in some countries, they've got powers to actually do that without going to court. And that's one of the things we're seeking to is bolster our regulations, but our legislation by giving us that power to do that. And that can make a big difference if we can charge economic operators or if we can oblige them potentially to actually test them where we see non-compliance, to oblige them to test them themselves and pay for it. Probably a better deterrent than us trying to reclaim the money back from them. Uh, larger, we deal with large amounts of information. Um, the, the problem is, is that quite often the economic operator doesn't know what to provide us with, um, indicating that they don't really know how to comply sometimes. I'm not saying this is a case with everybody. Obviously, clearly a number do know how to comply, but uh, we often receive large amounts of information in response to a technical documentation request. Um, and we've got to plough our way through that to try and find the, the, the test report, the relevant test report. Uh, I think we had a case recently where our consultants spent a good few hours ploughing through a report when they got to the last page and realised it was for the wrong product. You know, it's that sort of thing. So there may be IT solutions to that, which can help to pull out that. And I think there's definitely IT solutions to the uh, whole issue of information. And that's one of our SEI's areas of strength that we're seeking to work on. And we're actually going to be leading a work package within EE Plant 3 on developing IT tools to support market surveillance. Enforcement, as I've touched on already, the powers of the market surveillance authority, the legislation, yeah, we've already identified that it, it needs to be improved. Um, I think in fairness to legislators, until you know, they've drafted the legislation based on no knowledge really of actual market surveillance. So now we've got experience in market surveillance, we're able to inform the development of those, those regulations. And that's one of the things we're seeking to do. And we've talked to other countries about that as well. The level of proof required to enforce. So um, if, if it's a criminal enforcement case, beyond reasonable doubt. Um, if it's just a normal one, uh, civil, it's on the balance of probabilities. But So there's a burden of evidence gathering that we have to get there, and we have to make the decision very early on if we're going to go for a criminal enforcement. There's got to be good reasons for that. So it could be affecting someone's livelihood as well and affecting their life um, if we're going down that route. The, the time it takes and associated with the time it takes uh, to undertake enforcement, the legal costs potentially involved in that as well, you really want to steer clear of enforcement as much as you can. I can't emphasize enough, that enough, but at the same time, you need to use it as well um, to uh, provide a deterrent and you need to use it well. Identification and location of responsible economic operator is another big one for us because we can only take action within our jurisdiction. So we can only take action against economic operators based in Ireland. We can't take action against ones outside. So we've got examples where the economic operator is based in uh, Northern Ireland and selling a product through an Irish publication into Ireland, for example, and we can't take action against that. So we have to work with the UK, who do have jurisdiction, um, for them to take action against the economic operator. And there's a system called the ICSMS, where we um, can pass cases on to 
other member states for them to take the action. We can do certain things with distributors still within Ireland for economic operators who have responsibilities, but the, it's, it, the, it's not as good as actually acting against the economic operator themselves. Um, and occasionally the regulations can be a bit blurred um, and a little bit sort of a, a lack of clarity and sometimes those have to be clarified and there's a whole um, document grey area questions that you can find yourself if you want to um, on the eco-design website and the, on the commission's eco-design and energy labelling web website. And there's also just a note at the bottom, there's an imminent EU compliance and enforcement regulation set to strengthen market space across the EU. And there's a lot of the, the features of that look really good. Uh, and in particular, they provide us with, it's, it's, the game's changed since uh, the, the, the previous regulation was 2008. Um, and internet has obviously grown massively. So that creates new challenges for market space bodies and new sort of powers required to enable them to deal with the challenges of uh, fulfillment houses and things like that. So I've touched on this a lot about cooperation, but I think it's worth a slide in its own right about the, 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 you know, the, the need to uh, cooperate nationally, internationally and with stakeholders. In Ireland, um, we have different market surveillance bodies for different regulations. And that means there's a number of market surveillance bodies, uh, probably around about 20 or maybe even slightly more than that, who we have to interact with. Quite often, they might be involved in the same products as us, but they're not. They're dealing with a different dimension. So low voltage directive dealt with by Competition and Consumer Protection Commission and by us and by Comreg and by others. So we need to cooperate nationally. Internationally, clearly, we need to cooperate for the reasons I mentioned before, and there's mechanisms for doing that, including the ADCO, which is basically um, the meeting of my counterparts. We meet twice a year um, to work together and work out how we can operate better um, as a collective with the Commission. And then there's the EU projects, sort of joint action projects, where we work together and share information, which are particularly useful as well. Uh, and that these sort of the national and international ones helps us to uh, deal with the enforcement challenges across national boundaries. Uh, but I, I make the point there about stakeholders absolutely vital. And there's big EU stakeholders like Lighting Europe, for example, um, uh, the European the, the Heat Pump Association as well, European Heat Pump Association, for example, um, where I think we can get some benefit from working with them. Now, here's another challenge, awkward products. And this might be something for the engineers in here. Um, some products are too big to move. We can't send them to a laboratory in France because you can't move them. Um, so, for example, industrial fans and power transformers might be good examples of that. So we have to find different ways of actually testing those quite often in situ, often where they're, where they're being manufactured potentially or where they're actually being installed. But that's a challenge which has been addressed by an, an EU-funded project actually specifically dedicated to that challenge. Um, one's programmed to cir circumvent testing, the diesel emissions scandal. Well, the same thing potentially could happen, particularly as more products get smarter. They can be activated when they're being tested. They know when they're being tested and they turn, go into a mode, holiday mode for a fridge, for example, or something like that, which means they consume less energy. So it looks like they're better than they are. Um, so there's another EU funded project called Antix, uh, which I'm on the advisory board of, which is a great name, um, anti-circumvention, uh, which is, is also um, looking at that as well. So you know, these are the sort of things they sort of sparked off by the AGCO and by the Commission setting up uh, Horizon 2020 projects, which then uh, get funded and uh, help to explore some of these issues. And there's a point of compliance as well. So. Um, the point of compliance is typically putting a product onto the EU market, but it's also on certain products such as products such as ventilation, the moment of putting into service. Um, so again, you know, we have to, that's just a bit of a challenge for us in terms of doing that. It's a challenge for the people who are actually doing it, the engineers, um, building service engineers who are doing that type of thing. Uh, and uh, actually, that's, I was going to leave this slide because, I, because of time, so I think I will, but quantifying the impact, just to say, quantifying the impact of our work actually is, is another challenge for us. And I think it's one of the reasons why market surveillance um, gets a poor deal sometimes, um, because it's hard to quantify impact. Um, and it's not done well. So we're seeking to do that. And we've, uh, again, we've uh, commissioned uh, consultants to help us with that. And we've got some ideas around how we might better quantify our impact in future. So a good quick lighting case study. I'm, I'm running against the clock here a little bit, but just to give you an example of what we've been doing, um, we took the approach of stakeholder engagement, as I said, at the very start of our approach to 
um, lighting. So we met with Lighting Association of Ireland, um, uh, Enterprise Ireland, the department. We undertook a market screening exercise acting on the information from stakeholders as to where the compliance issues were. We also talked to um, people who'd been involved in EE Plant um, 1, uh, which dealt with lighting. And that led us to focus most of our attentions on TU10s, which are the spotlights, so probably the ones directly above me, um, where they are known to be uh, compliance issues. So we wrote to 29 economic operators, M many of them were Irish-based entities because we, you know, we wanted to apply our power where we could, uh, but it wasn't exclusively that. We investigated compliance of over 200 GU10 LEDs, but it's still a small section of the market, let's be honest. Um, we undertook physical, so sorry, I mean, technical documentation checking took a while, you know, took, can take a, a long time. I mean, it can involve, first of all, writing to the economic operator, um, typically receiving information which is not good enough, um, then writing out to them again and asking for more information, and then eventually, hopefully, getting to the answer. In some cases, some of them didn't bother responding at all, so we've had to take action against those. Um, so it's, that's a time-consuming uh, approach uh, aspect, but it, it, it's, it, you know, it has to be done to some extent. We also did physical screening of photometric parameters. We bought a piece of kit that you'll see in the pitch there called a light spy on. It's a very small suitcase, but it enables us to measure photometric um, properties of or characteristics of, of lights, lamps, um, various different ones, including tubes. You can do, believe it or not, with that piece of kit. Um, but we've actually found that has been quite a useful screening exercise, and you'll see in a minute why. And we used that on on all the bulbs that we sent for testing, and we used it to help prioritise as well. Um, we also uh, selected a, a number of lamps, light bulbs from the market, um, mixed lamps. There are all sorts of things: CFLs, um, LEDs, um, halogens, uh, and such like. And we use that information to send things for testing because we found quite a few to be non-compliant. And we've tested um, over in a laboratory in the UK, we've tested 12 lamps, cost of 20 grand, around thereabouts. Um, eight out of 12 so far have tested non-compliance. So we're pretty pleased with that because that's showing that our approach um, to, tar well, <laughs> either everything on the market is non-compliant or we've got a good approach in terms of our targeting. And I like to think it's, well, there is certainly a degree of non-compliance in the market, but I like to think we've used quite a good methodology for arriving at that. Um, they're still being tested. Uh, so some have been tested against time-bound characteristics, and that's another problem because um, 6,000 hour test on lumen maintenance. So how long does it maintain its lumen output to the, a, a respectable level? 6,000 hours, well, we won't get the results till May, by which time those light lamps may well be no longer sold. doesn't mean we can't take action, action against the economic operator, but placing a stop on the market is not one of them. Uh, we'll have to look at some other sort of solution. Uh, we're working with the UK MSA, as I've mentioned, they've been doing their own testing and we've been, we sat down with them and had a very good meeting with them um, just a couple of weeks back. Uh, so the next step is to follow up on enforcement and we review everything we do as well to make sure that we're doing it in the most effective way. Um, for example, is technical documentation check the best way of doing it? If it takes ages to do it, should we skip that, go straight to the uh, lights fly on and um, test them that way and then put them to laboratory testing? You know, these are things, questions um, we have to deal with. So just to conclude then, um, a market surveillance is an is a absolutely vital component to the implementation of the regulations. I think it's fair to say it has historically been quite weak across the EU due to the lack of resources primarily, uh, but it's becoming stronger. Uh, SEI is developing its capacity of its market surveillance and contributing significantly to efforts to improve market surveillance across the EU. And the market surveillance is a collaborative endeavour and we welcome input from industry, trade associations, and professional bodies such as your own, um, which can support our work. So it just remains the final bit. If you want to find out more, there's a slide there with quite a few useful um, sources of information if you don't know them already in websites. Um, so uh, you know, look forward to answering any questions you might have. And thank you very much for listening. Thanks very much, gents. So we have a few questions here, and then if I just turn on the mics. Uh, so I just might kick off on my own. Just as, uh, but yeah, I'll let you up here. But just to body, then, um, what um, outside of Europe, what other regions are, and what are, what are other regions doing? Are there any other regions or countries doing something similar to this? 
or is it Europe that's kind of ended up policing the, the manufacturing end of things in the likes of China and so on? So, uh, yeah, what I'll do is I'll let you sit up here in a second. Yeah, I'd say the answer to that question is it's a bit of both. Uh, if you want to place product on the market in Europe, you obviously have to comply with eco design regulations in Europe. So you'll find that manufacturers in other jurisdictions, particularly in Asia, uh, are operating to eco-design standards. So you'll find that they'll have equivalent or similar standards being developed in these countries. The same is happening in America, South America, in terms of, of certain products. It's not always completely aligned. I'll give an example, ICT products, which conventionally would have been, uh, everyone's probably familiar with the Energy Star label that you would see on, on computer products. There's no longer an Energy Star agreement between Europe and the US. Now, there's political issues behind that. Uh, we won't, won't, won't say any more. But it, it's an issue. So there can be divergence between certain products, and that can be a big issue when uh, you're trying to import or export a product into a particular market. Uh, but again, you could have a product being brought in from China where the product could be tested, conformity tested in China in a, a, an accredited lab, and the documentation is with it, and it can be placed on the European market. That's not to say it's compliant. That's where Tim comes in and can test the product to ensure compliance. And that's that's where market surveillance and conformity assessments, there, there's divergence there, but the, that's the idea behind the, the, the way it operates. I, I'll just say, I think Mark's covered that very well, so I won't add much other to say that we were undertaking an energy label inspection the other day, not myself, and we came across a fridge with a South African energy label on it. So uh, that was a first for us, but um, there are a number of uh, other countries which are operating. Uh, and I'd say well, one of the most advanced would be the likes of, of Australasia. So you'll find Austria, New Zealand, Australia, New Zealand, for particular products were ahead of the game. Uh, and, and, you know, that applies to different marketplaces. They can be ahead. Uh, one one thing to remember in certain parts of Europe for particular products, I won't mention countries, but there were existing member states where their own national legislation was actually further ahead than the eco design legislation. So, you know, they had particular national issues around heating or whatever, or pollution issues, that their appliances were covered by national legislation. That they had to actually roll back slightly to harmonize with the the rest of Europe. Now, hopefully that will move on as the years pass. But you can see where it comes from. But your question was more at a global level. Yeah, thanks very much. Jim. Uh, thanks very much to both of you for excellent presentations. Um, I actually have a number of questions, so I don't know what way to do it uh, in terms of. But uh, the first one is actually in relation, picking up on an earlier slide, one of your early slides, Mark, on uh, which you showed the relative importance i think of this uh, of the different types of products in ireland and way way ahead were heating or hvac products and lighting was quite low in the in the list um so i just wondered is that just is why is that given the what we've already heard i mean lighting does seem to be a an obvious um technology to be addressed by this and just uh, in terms of the commercial buildings market for example and the energy savings that would be due to lighting i would have thought they would be up there fairly close to what they are with heating uh, i would say over the last 10 years 10 to 15 years the the amount of electricity used by lighting has come significantly down in comparison to other sectors relative yeah. to other sectors yeah. uh, definitely heating would be heating cooling in europe is is by far the biggest user of, of energy. Uh, lighting, we've seen, especially in terms of the market now, most of the products on the marketplace from here on in are LED and the usage, the energy usage is, is significantly lower. That's not to say yeah. it can't improve, but as a percentage of the overall market. Yeah, no. Uh, yeah. Unless it, it, it per, the, you know, the technology permeates into a larger amount of products or more usage of the actual technology in terms of energy usage, it's re it really has gone down. Okay, sorry, I may have misinterpreted your slide. Then I thought I thought I was looking at a slide again, on savings I, I, rather than on consumption. Yeah, on the slide itself, it's actually from the the vegan mahu. More, yeah, vegan mo mo vegan mogo, I see mogo. Mogo. mogo Very hard to pronounce. A Danish <laughs> consultancy who carried out that particular report who looked at certain products. Now I'm sure there were exceptions of products that weren't included. I don't, I don't know whether uh, the energy sector was included there in terms of. Uh, well, we co we covered it was all products covered by eco design and energy labelling, which are covered by that either in uh, force or coming into force. 
And um, yeah, what that table, what that chart was setting out was the energy saving potential of those product groups um, through the through the measure, through eco design and energy labelling by at 2030. Uh, I okay. think you know, just adding what to Mark to what Mark said. I mean, the space heating, uh, the, the heating and cooling sector, sorry, heating and uh, space heating and water heating sector is huge by comparison with lighting. And, and I would agree that um, you know what you see if you look at the curve on the lighting is that the, the there is large saving potential um, during the ten, the, you know, the, the teens, as it were. Um, and when we get into the 2020s, then that saving potential begins to drop off because there's less replacement of lamps as well um, and lighting because of LEDs and there's a lower amount of energy being used. Okay, th thanks very much. My second question was in relation to uh, I think I heard uh, I read very recently that I think the eco design um, scope was being extended to cover things like windows uh, and uh, building fabric, if you like, uh, issues, which is very interesting and it, bear, it bears out what you're saying, at Mark, about in about the importance of installation, not just the product. But uh, and with with the move towards NZEB, um, things like this become very important. So I'm just wondering is what sort of um, if that coordination is happening there, or is there any coordination at the European level between the eco design, um, if you like, community and the buildings directive community? Yeah, it's, they're, they're, you know they're very much aligned. I won't say it's perfect by any means, but they're definitely aware of each other. A lot of the same stakeholders will be involved in the different areas. Uh, definitely, as I mentioned in the, in the presentation, the systems, the building envelope is very much of concern, particularly in terms of uh, you know, the, 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 the way some products are moving. Uh, you were right in saying that we're, we're, we are looking and there are studies ongoing at the minute in terms of what other products we can actually use that aren't conventional energy using products. So everything from, from, as you mentioned, windows to tap shower heads, all that sort of stuff that do have an impact in terms of, you know, your water is heated, but you have to use the water. So there's a there's an indirect impact in, on energy usage there, even in terms of taps and shower heads. Uh, but the, the, the second part of your question in terms of alignment of different regulations, it's a difficult one. It's an ongoing one. There's always, you know, opportunities to synergize better. We're, we're working on it. We're, we are very much aware of, of how other regulations affect. I'll give you an example that's slightly outside that in terms of the we and Ross regulation. You know, we have to be very careful not to double regulate as well because if we set a particular, you know, in terms of an eco design regulation on 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 a material in a plastic or, or a bromo flame or tardant or whatever, we have to be very careful before the regulation comes under review. If anything changes in we, you can see it starts to upset the apple cart and you can have a manufacturer with very onerous obligations around the same issue in different regulations. So we have to be very careful in terms of alignment, but it is something that we actually consider. Okay, thanks. Do, will I hand the mic over to somebody? I have a couple of other questions, but I might I'd maybe take a break and just let other people. Okay, just uh, the one online, I think just two, two parts to this question. I think the first part you've answered is, in terms of online sales, does the surveillance cover these? And then, what are the most likely products to fall foul of compliance? <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, I mean, yes, um, on, products sold online have to be correctly labelled. Um, all products that are covered by the energy labelling regulation are also covered by the online regulation as well. Tyres are also covered by that as well. And what we tend to find, actually, it's by economic operator. Um, so some are really good um, and they have everything labelled nearly correct, pretty well. And then others are absolutely abysmal. So um, we don't tend to find well. Uh, yeah, I don't think there's any particular trends I've seen online as such in relation to particular product groups. I suppose um, it's true to say uh, when it comes to uh, they're already not labelling them properly, but they tend to provide information regarding energy where it suits them to do so. Um, so in other words, where it, they think it's a selling point for a product, but they should, of course, be showing the label um, or showing uh, a little arrow which you can hover over and click on, which opens up the label and also product information as well so it's very poor um and it's something that you know we, we've uh, unfortunately the regulation has been a little bit unclear about exactly how to comply so we've been waiting for that to be cleared up a little bit now we've got it cleared we're producing guidance 
and um, we've reviewed websites and we're going to be contacting a number of companies um, to tell them how to do things better. But one thing we have found is that you can talk to a lot of these companies directly and they're very amenable to actually making the changes. You don't have to go in with your size 14 like me and um, and cause trouble. You can talk to them about it and they say, well, actually, that's fine. Yeah, we, we don't mind it. We'll, we'll, we'll comply. And just the last one online here is uh, in terms of the economic uh, operators, uh, did I see the benefit in the directives? There must be some that, like, like you said there, I'm going to be on question here, but there must be some that are kind of quite happy with the directives when they're kind of, they have yeah. a... Say, I, I that. I'd say in general, uh, most economic operators are fully behind the regulation. In fact, a lot of the regulations have been driven by economic operators. And if you look at the formulation, and I'd be involved in that in terms of the formulation of regulation, it's very much industry driven. As I said in the presentation, it's very transparent. But you'll find that all the, the major industry bodies, which you'd expect as lobbyists, would be involved. But at a, at a, at a, a deeper level, you'll find companies in there. Uh, when a preparatory study on a product starts, it's obliged to have a website and stakeholder engagement is, is encouraged. A lot of these products are very specialized. Uh, the Commission and ourselves at a national level, we're not expert on these. We may be expert on certain products or aspects of certain types of products. So we need in terms of formulation of regulations, we need industry involved and other stakeholders, but particularly industry involved to help us in terms of ICT in particular. It's very, very technical. Things like network standby, servers, very, very technical. So without the, the, the economic operators in this space driving it, you know, we wouldn't come to fruitful conclusions in terms of, of regulations. But you will find that they want these regulations because from an innovation perspective in Europe, it drives innovation and it gives them added value in comparison to operators outside Europe. So very much uh, industry in Europe would be very pro this. Uh, it's, it's, I won't say it's bringing back manufacturing to Europe, but it's definitely adding value to manufacturing in Europe in terms of design, product design, uh, and issues around that. Yeah. The only thing I'd just add to that is I, I think it's, you know, not all industry likes the regulations, to be quite honest with you. Um, I can't necessarily characterise those that don't, but clearly those who know less about what they're doing don't particularly like it. Um, I, and, you know, there may be some smaller businesses in particular for whom it feels quite a burden, you know, where they are a manufacturer by virtue of uh, branding a product in their own name and bringing it in from outside the EU who, you know, I, I'm not saying that, that, that they would all feel against it, but you certainly get some who feel it's a sort of a unnecessary burden on them and puts them at a disadvantage and that it's more something for the big players. But equally, you might get some big players who don't like it as well. But I think I, I, I agree, Mark's probably at the end where you know, broadly there's more support for it than there's, there's uh, than the, the not. Um. Thanks again. Uh, I'll actually ask the question, just a three in one question, maybe. First one is the Triple E register Tim mentioned. Um, that's, uh, I, I get the impression, how up to date is that? Because it seems it, there, uh, there are quite a number of good products that are not on it at this stage. And it, it seems to exclude, for example, particular types of pumps. Which are uh, you know variable speed control pumps, which are which are would have been which would be I think among the leading presence in the Irish market, based on my own observations in recent years. Um, the second question then in, it, then is in relation to lab infrastructure here in Ireland. Um, what's the could you just kind of outline what's the state of play in terms of lab infrastructure? How often do you have to go overseas to actually um, get products tested? Uh, uh, to to all because I presume if you've got a lab, it's got a very expensive accreditation process attached to it. Has to have a fairly high volume of of activity, and that it covers not just you know the list of directives that you're, for example, that that you showed in relation to lighting. And the third question is just in relation to it's kind of an adjunct to a question that was asked from 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 the online, which is take, taking your G10 example. Um, what's the what what's the mode of failure? What's the most common mode or, of non-compliance? Is it is it energy performance? Is it uh, hours of life? Is it toxic content or or what is it? Okay, yeah. Um, first of all, in relation to Tripoli, I mean I, I'm not well qualified to answer the question uh, on that one. Um, so I'll be careful what I say on that. Um, to the best of my knowledge, uh, Tripoli has been has been reviewed 
at the moment. Um, and I am aware uh, that there are products which are unable to get on uh, the register, for example, in the lighting sector, um, where they might be more efficient products than some of the ones that are on there. So the whole thing is being reviewed at the moment. Um, but I think the Tripoli has high potential uh, in terms of being a driver for economic operations and for uh, good in terms of um, guiding people who are specifying products uh, along the right course. So that's all I can really say on that. Regards to laboratory testing, um, I have to say I'm not aware of any laboratories um, within Ireland which actually test products uh, under the eco design or energy labeling regulations that's not to say there aren't but we have not encountered any in any of the product groups that we've looked at so far so we are always having to send our products overseas to have them tested i mean there are a number of testing options uh, across the eu um, for a lot of products there are certain products where maybe there's a there's a dearth of um, testing laboratories um, I do have a bit of concern about that, and I think the EU does as well, that you know, there needs to be sufficient testing capacity in order for it to be competitive as well and to provide um, good prices to ourselves. Um, so uh, what's the third question? Sorry. It's just the modes of failure. <laughs> oh, modes of failure. Sorry, yes. Um, now, we only had the results back um, a week and a half ago. The, my initial impression of the results is actually there's, <clears throat> there are certain areas where maybe there's been more failures than others, um, uh, but actually it's scattered across the um, photometric parameters that are being looked at uh, so far. So um, there's probably some parameters where which were holding up pretty well, but it was things like power factor, for example, um, the energy label itself sometimes they uh, actually under declare um, what their label is so they're erring on the side of caution and uh, we certainly wouldn't take them to task over that but it is possible they do that and we have one or two instances like that um, but it really does uh, it, you know it's cu cutting across quite a few of them but what i suppose another characteristic would be that um, often the lamp is failing in quite a few areas not just one um, and then the good ones obviously passing everything um, and we are only looking at eco design and energy labeling uh, and that's one of the challenges for us to join up better with other markets finance bodies um, so that, for example where we are testing in relation to eco design well maybe we could be testing in relation to low voltage directive emc and such like as well now there's procurement issues on that in working across organizations but and you wouldn't think it would be insurmountable for us to work a, a little bit better along those lines i think safety is is one of the key areas of non-compliance or for GU10s, it's, it's, you know, that's one of the key aspects where there's definite problems. And obviously, it's let's be honest, it's more serious than the energy side of things, where something's going to go on light and um, potentially kill someone. Uh, I happen to come from the building side of things, and I can assure you, we're very interested in compliance and labelling. And uh, just uh, two questions on uh, one particular incident which is quite common now, somebody orders something from um, somewhere, mostly could be China or could be the UK or anywhere else, it comes via Amazon or eBay or someone. What's the situation on um, the reliability of the labeling and things there? I mean, is for example, they invariably have the CE label. Is, it, is there a, a way of verifying that? They're genuine, or would they be taken as genuine? Yeah, I, I, it, this is the, the fulfilment dimension of this it has been a, a problem, and that's why this new compliance and enforcement regulation is, is coming into effect. It helps us to deal with those sort of instances because it's quite a common thing that um, uh, lamps are coming in, for example, or lamps, any other product can yeah. come in from China yeah. directly yeah. to someone's home. So yeah. they're not going through an economic operator or, or either. And that, it's, that is going to be a challenge come what may. Um, I think we can try, you know, one of the approaches to that has to be education of consumers regards the potential for what they're buying. Now, in, in a lot of cases where things are going through customs, if they're going through uh, uh, first, then we can potentially deal with those 
um, if we have good arrangements in place with customer authorities because we can identify products that are coming in and we can deal with those. Um, but for those ones at the moment, when it comes to coming in from China directly for a f fulfillment center, I'm afraid we don't have much power other than to work with um, the fulfillment provider. And uh, to be fair to some of them, you know, some of the bigger ones, they're working quite well to try and take products off their websites, uh, which are non-compliant. But they're doing it on a pretty much a voluntary basis at the moment. Um, that will be tackled in some way by the, the compliance enforcement regulation when it comes into effect, at least to an extent. Okay. Just uh, some of these things are, are actually being subjected to duties. Does that make them possible to be spotted or to be checked or not? Well, I would have thought, I mean, I don't know enough about that, but I would say if they are subject to duties coming in, that means they're coming through customs. Yeah. And if they're coming through customs, then it is possible to pinpoint deliveries that are coming through customs. And actually, that was one of the, the fruits of discussing with the Latvian uh, Marcus Events body. Um, they have an excellent system with their customs, uh, the customs uh, actually have a, an excellent system of their own, which they allow markets for bodies to log into. And they get uh, regular updates from customers regarding the products that they're interested in. And it enables them to then respond to those quickly. Um, in Ireland, we don't have that yet. We do have some cooperation with the uh, customs authorities, and we're building on that, and working with them. Um, but there's much more that needs to be done um, in order for us to tackle that particular issue. Thank you very much. A very good presentation. I'm going to have to go. So we'll go one more and then one quick one. Sorry. Yes, yeah, a quick question for Mark on your slide on the solid fuel boilers. Um, you mentioned there is no standard um, like biomass boilers. There, there, uh, the, the, what I mentioned about standards there was there are, th there are three basically three mechanisms whereby boilers, both small and large solid fuel boilers, can be uh, regulated. There's the Industrial Emissions Directive, the ID for above 20. For below 20 megawatt, there's the medium combustion plant directive. So anything under one megawatt, i.e. small boiler. Now, you know, realistically, anything from, from up to, to one megawatt is not going to be used in a domestic or commercial scene scenario in reality. But it, they can be up to 70, 80, 100, sort of that level. But in terms of standards, there is no standard in place. There's no uh, European standard in place between uh, 500, and one, 500 and and 1 megawatt. So do you have a standard up to 500 kilowatt? Now, there is a standard being developed. So SEN, SENELEC have got a mandate to develop that standard. So hopefully by the time that product comes to review, which is a couple of years from now, there will be a standard in place so they can extend the scope of the directive from zero to one so everything will be covered then. Because there is an issue of a possible loophole here. It's unlikely. But technically, someone could buy two boilers and escape the actual, or go just sorry, just go slightly over and escape regulation. So it's something that we'd have to look at. But it's a grey area, but something that will be, you know, uh, remedied over the next couple of years. Okay, I think that's it. So um, thank you very much. It was two great presentations, and uh, we'll just give a quick round of applause.